Yesterday before the first service, I was uh, sitting upstairs in my little study at home, had the window wide open because it's such a beautiful day, and you know, all of a sudden comes in that wafting smell of barbecue. <laughs> and you go, somebody's barbecue, and that just smells so good. And then after a little while I realized, that's not barbecue, that's somebody's burning trash. <laughs> and uh, then it got a little bit stronger, and the more I smelled it, I said, that's not trash, that's a grass fire. So Kay and I went out in our backyard and the slope was on fire. And uh, so she calls the, the fire department and they said, somebody just beat you to it. We've got four trucks on the way and they did show up and the helicopter came over and was bombing the canyon because I live out in the canyon. And, and it, was, uh, it was an experience. So I spent about an hour before the last service, you know, kind of watering down my precious fruit trees so that they wouldn't get, get, get singed. Uh, I didn't want toasted peaches and, uh, or, or dried apricots or whatever. And, uh, and, and so, you know, I was a little late to, to uh, getting to the first service. And so I ran out to my truck and I got in, the, got in and started up and the, the battery was dead. Now, this just teaches a very key truth of life. One of the important lessons of life is just three words. It's always something. Okay. You just need to know that. It's always something. You're either coming out of a problem or you're in the middle of a big problem or you're getting ready to go into the next one. Because life is simply a series of problems, one after another. And because of that, you often get tired, you get fatigued, and you feel like giving up. And that's what we're going to look at this weekend. Now, this letter is old, but it's just as true today it was when I got it. Dear Pastor Rick, if I could sum up my life in a single word, it would be the word conflict. It seems I have to fight for everything. Everything's a battle. A battle with my kids, a battle with my husband, a battle with my job. Even my walk with the Lord is a battle. And we struggle in our home. We struggle with our money. We struggle with our intimate life. We struggle even just to understand each other. Plus, I got all my internal battles, all my internal fears, and the wars going on inside me. I can't seem to stick with stuff, even when I know it's the right thing to do. Why is life so tough? Will the battle ever end? I hope so, because sometimes I just feel like walking away from it all. It's a good question. Why is life? so tough because it is it is tough you see we're not in paradise anymore john milton wrote a poem about that paradise lost when adam and eve decided to disobey god to rebel when adam and eve decided you know what god we think we know what will make us happier than you do more than you do and so we're going to make our plan for our life rather than your plan Sin entered the world, and we lost paradise. And everything was broken by sin in the world. We've talked about this many times. We live in a fallen world. Nothing works perfectly on this planet. That's why we play, pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because God's will is done perfectly in heaven. It is never done perfectly on earth. Everything is broken. The weather is broken. That's why we have all of these cataclysmic, you know, freak accidents and tornadoes and hurricanes and stuff like that because the, the weather is broken. The economy is broken. Your body is broken. It doesn't work right. It's not a perfect body. It has problems with it. Every relationship is broken. Nobody has a perfect marriage. Nobody has perfect children. Nobody has perfect parents. Every family is broken. Nothing on this planet works perfectly except God's word, his truth. Now, that's enough to discourage you. But in addition to that, there is a cosmic battle going on in your life. It is an unseen war. There are forces that are meant to destroy your soul. The Bible calls these three enemies of your soul, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The first is the battle going on inside you. 
And that's the biggest one of all. It's the war inside you, because when you're at war with God, you're at war with yourself. And the war inside you is you have an old nature, a sinful nature, that doesn't always want to do the right things. Do you ever do things that you know aren't good for you, but you do them anyway? Yes. Have you ever done things that were self-defeating, that still you went ahead and did it? Yes. Have you ever made bad decisions? Yes. Have you ever done the thing that made the problem worse rather than better? Yes. Are there habits in your life that you cannot seem to break free from? Yes. That's the battle within. The Bible calls it your flesh. It calls it your old nature. It wants to do the wrong thing. It's like don't touch the hot stove or don't touch the wet paint. What do you want to do? Touch it. Just to see what it's like. And that is the battle within. Then there's the battle around you, and that is the world. That is our culture. Everything in our culture tears you down. It doesn't build you up. The culture says, if you're not the most beautiful or the most talented or the most perfect or the smartest person, you ain't worth squat. And if you're not the valedictorian, you're just an also ran, and really your life doesn't matter. And we glorify and idolize the top and forget 99.9999 of everybody else. And the world wants to pull you down and you have peer pressure at work, at school, from friends, from relatives, to pull you in all kinds of directions that many times you don't even want to go those directions. And that's the battle around you. And then there's the battle against you. Satan is real. There is a real devil. Now he is not equal to God. He was created by God and he rebelled. And God is in control. But Satan wants to destroy your life. Now Satan cannot hurt God. So the best way he can think of is to hurt God's children. And he wants to destroy your life. He wants to mess it up. He wants, he is committed to your failure in life. Now you don't have to be afraid of Satan. If you know the right tools, you know the right defense, you know the right ammo to use. And that's why this summer we're gonna start a major series that I'm calling The Invisible War. It's an encouraging series that you really need this because everything is a battle and you need to know how to overcome the battles of life. Now the people in the Bible who won their battles, who finished the race well, who finished well in life are called God's Hall of Fame. And God's Hall of Fame is found in one chapter of the Bible, the book of Hebrews chapter 11. If you have your message notes, go ahead and take it out. In Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about all these great men and great women who made it through the battles of life. They fought the war and they won. They were victorious. They succeeded with their lives. Now, it's a list of people that you've heard of many, many times. People like Noah and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses is mentioned, Joshua is mentioned. The Bible talks about David and Gideon and uh, 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 Samson and all of the prophets. And it, it just, there's a list in Hebrews 11 of the people who won the battles in their life. But at the end of Hebrews 11, at the beginning of chapter 12, it gives a passage for your encouragement. And it says, you know, just because you're living a life of faith doesn't mean you're going to have a happy ending in every area of life. Just because you are doing the right thing and God is pleased with you, you're still going to have some suffering. You're still going to have some pain. You're still going to feel like giving up. And it starts by talking about a group of other people who didn't see their prayers answered, who saw the promises that God had made to them uh, delayed or uh, unrealized, and who experienced great pain. In verse 35 of Hebrews 11, it says this, but others, talking besides the Abraham and Joseph and Moses, all these people, but others trusted God and they were tortured preferring rather to die than to turn from God and be free. Did you know that more people died this last year? Uh, 14 million people were killed uh, because of their faith in Jesus Christ around the world. People don't talk about that much. More people have died for their faith in the last 100 years than all previous 2,000 years combined. So torture is still going on of Christians today all around the world. It says preferring to die rather than turn from God and be free. They placed their hope in the resurrection to a better life. They weren't just living for here and now. 
And then it goes on and tells us some of the things that people of faith have had to go through. Some were mocked, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in dungeons, and some died by stoning, and some were sawed in half, and others were killed by the sword. Some went about in skins of sheep and goats, hungry and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world. I want God to be able to say that about you, that you were too good for this world. They wandered over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. And all of these people we've mentioned, they received God's approval. God was pleased with them because of their faith. Yet, none of them received all that God had promised. For God had far better things in mind. God had far better things in mind. For us, that's us, he's talking to you right now, that would also benefit them. For they can't receive the prize at the end of the race until we finish the race. Whoa, now this is a heavy passage. I could spend the entire morning just on this, but I want to get to the practical section in the next few verses. But I do want to point out three important things that this passage teaches us. First, it teaches us that faith does not spare me from pain. The health and wealth gospel that says, if I just have enough faith, I'll never be sick. If I just have enough faith, I'll never have any debt. If I just have enough faith, I'll never have any problems, is a total bogus lie. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches that some of the greatest tests of faith are when you are sick, when you are in debt, when you are in pain, that's when it's hard to trust God. It's easy to trust God when everything's going your way. The real test of your faith is when life sucks. When things aren't going well, that's when your faith is really tested. And faith does not spare us from pain. The second thing it teaches is that some of God's promises will be fulfilled in eternity. Now we think all of God's promises have to be filled, fulfilled here and now, because you're only thinking about the 80 or 90 or 100 years you're gonna live on this planet. But you are made to last forever. And God has all of eternity to fulfill his promises to you. And some of the promises that God has made in his word, he is going to fulfill them to you and to everyone else in all of eternity. He's got all of eternity to do it. He doesn't have to fulfill them all right now before you die. The third thing that we see from this passage is that we are runners in a far bigger, grand, historical relay race. Notice it says, they can't receive the prize at the end of the race until we finish the race. Now imagine this, your life is just one cog in a giant wheel. God has a plan to create a family that's gonna live with him forever. And he's been building this family for thousands of years. And the previous generation ran with the baton and handed it off to our generation. And now we are running with the baton, the race that God has for us, and we will hand it off to the next generation. And they will run the race God has for them until they hand it off to the next generation until God's timing is finished for history on this planet. Now, how absurd would it be if you're at the Olympics and you're watching the 800 meter relay and the guy who finishes the first 200 meters stops and says, may I have my gold medal now? And you say, well, time out, the race isn't finished. Well, I finished my part. Well, yes, you may have finished your part, but you're part of a relay. And you don't get the reward until everybody finishes. And then when you win at the end, your team wins, then you get the gold. Some of the rewards that God has planned for you, you're not going to get in this lifetime. They're going to come when the race is finished. And it says that the people who were before us, these Abrahams and Moses and Davids and Josephs and Joshuas and all these people, says they can't receive the prize at the end of the race until we finish the race. So, how do we make sure that we finish the race? More specifically, how do we make sure you finish the race God has planned for you so that you get the reward? that you don't give up 50 yards in because life isn't a 50-yard is dash, it's a marathon. 
How do you make it to the end where God says, good job, that's my boy. Good job, that's my girl. Well, in the next passage, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, it gives us six powerful keys to handling discouragement. What to do when you feel like giving up. Let's read it. It says in verse one, therefore, since we are surrounded, now remember I always tell you, whenever you see a therefore in the Bible, you wanna find out what it's therefore, right. You say, in light of what I've just said about Abraham and Moses and David and Joshua and Noah and all of these great people of the Bible, therefore, because of all these people, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, these people are witnessing what's going on to the life of faith, the one that we're living. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Now we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from start to finish. He was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterwards. He's looking past the cross to the joy in heaven. Now he's seated in the place of highest honor besides God's throne in heaven. Now think about all he, Jesus, endured when sinful people did such terrible things to him so you don't become weary and give up. When you feel like giving up, think about what he endured. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. He says, I don't see you being a martyr. You haven't shed any blood for the faith. Now this is a very powerful passage with six key truths on what to do when you feel like giving up. In Hebrews 12, God tells us there are six things you need to do when you feel like giving up. I don't know what's been discouraging you, maybe something, maybe you're out of work, maybe something in a marriage or with your kids or a health issue, but whatever it is, you picked a good Sunday to come to church because we're gonna look at these very helpful steps. Now let's get right into it. Number one, the first thing God teaches us in Hebrews 12 is that when I feel like giving up, I need to remember heaven is watching me. Remember that heaven is watching me. Now I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on this, but you have a audience in heaven watching your life, not just God. Now we know that God is watching your life. We know the Bible says in Job 31, 4, he sees everything I do and every step I take. God has never missed anything in your life. God saw you being formed in your mother's womb. He saw you take your first breath. He saw you watch take your first step. He has seen everything and heard every thought you've ever had. He knows the good and the bad and the ugly and he still loves you. The Bible says he has every hair on your head counted. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. That in him, before him, all things are naked and unseen, and seen. And the Bible tells us that God is aware of everything in your life, so obviously God's watching, but more than that. Verse one says this, therefore, in light of Abraham, Moses, all these guys, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Now that's, that's a pretty heavy thought to think of the fact that Abraham may be watching your life. And Moses may be watching your life. Or Joshua may be watching your life. And seeing how you're doing in your battles. And I'm sure Noah's going, you think you had a tough one? I had to build an ark. <laughs> and Moses going, you think what you're going through right now is tough? I had to lead a million complaining spiritual babies out of slavery. And Abraham said, you think you're going through stuff? I had to leave my home at age 80 and pack up my entire family and move to a country I had never seen and been to and start over at 80. You think you're going through a tough time? This is the cloud of witnesses. But they're not there to judge you, they're there to encourage you. They want you to succeed, they want you to win. 
you have an audience. What am I saying? Nothing you do in your life is really private. Nothing you do in your life is personal. Nothing you do in your life is a secret. Heaven is watching. Since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to this life of faith, we need to not give up because we know people who've already been there, done that, gone through it, and some of them much, much worse than things we've gone through, and they made it, and they're pulling for us. The Bible tells us that in heaven, Jesus is praying for you. Did you know that? Jesus is praying for you to make it. Now, number two. The second thing we need to do when we feel like giving up is we need to eliminate what doesn't matter. If I'm going to make it to the end of the race, I need to take off any extra clothing, any extra heavy things, any responsibilities that are holding me back and eliminate what doesn't matter. Now, the Bible says in the second part of verse 1, because we're surrounded by this crowd of witnesses, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress. Now circle weight and circle sin, because these are the two things that hold you back, sins and weights. These are the two things that discourage you, sins and weights. These are the two things that keep you from completing the race, sins and weights. Now, what's a, what's a weight? A weight, obviously, is not a sin because it's different. A weight could be a good thing. A weight is anything that slows me down. You might write that down. It, a weight is anything in my life that slows me down in God's race for me. It can be a good thing. It could be a relationship. It could be a job. It could be an activity. It could be a sport that you're spending too much time with and it's slowing you down from what you were put on this planet to do. It's a good thing. Ha have you realized, have you learned that some things are not necessarily wrong, they're just not necessary? Have you learned that you don't have time to do every good thing in life? That just because it's a good thing doesn't mean you should do it? It's like money, just because you can afford it doesn't mean you should buy it. You need to learn the discipline of saying no. That's a strong thing for growing up spiritually. That just because I can afford it doesn't mean I'm gonna buy it. And just because it's a good thing doesn't mean I should do it. You can drown in good things. You can be overwhelmed by good things. You can get discouraged by too many things in your life that are a good thing to do, but you're trying to do too much. If you are burning the candle at both ends, you're not as bright as you think you are. <laughs> and you filled your schedule and you've packed it. Would you agree it's easier to fill a schedule than to fulfill it? How many would agree with that? Yeah. A and so you must learn to say no to good things. Some things aren't bad, they're just, you can't do every good thing. You might write this down. To grow, I must say no. <laughs> to grow, I must say no. You've got to learn the two letters in the middle of the alphabet, N-O. And that's going to free up a lot of time. You've got to lay aside the weights, the things that, that hold you back. Now, a weight could be a memory. Some of you are stuck in the past, and it's either a positive memory, and you don't want to get out of it, or it's a negative memory, and you want to hold on to it. And you can't get on with your life because you're stuck in the past. That's a weight, a memory. A, a tradition can be a weight. We've always done it this way in, fam, in our family, but families change. And so you may have to do it in a new way. A tradition can be a weight. It's not a bad thing. It's just a tradition. A, an unrealistic expectation can be a weight. What you're expecting of yourself is totally unrealistic. Or maybe it's an unrealistic expectation put on you by your parents, or by your partner, or by peers, or by professionals, and the people around you, and you're living for the approval of other people. Peer pressure, you need to declutter your life. You need to lay aside every weight. When something is not going right, when 
you start to get discouraged, when you feel like you've stopped making progress, it's time for a little personal evaluation. And you do a little spring cleaning and you clean out the clutter spiritually in your life or whatever you need to do. Now you know that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different results. That's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting it to be different. You know, some of you, uh, you know, I'm so proud of you who became a part of the Daniel plan. You know, we started in January. It's a one-year plan. It's not too late to join up. You can go to thedanielplan.com. And we said, we're going to get in shape this year. We're going to have a healthier church at the end of the year physically than we were at the beginning. And over 14,000 of you have signed up online and are tracking your progress online on a daily or weekly basis, 14,000. In fact, since January, our church has lost over 200,000 pounds. <laughs> that, that's just what's been reported. That's amazing. Okay, that's, ama that's what those of you who've reported in online on, on the website. That's over 1,000 pounds a day. You just look better from this point of view. I want to tell you that. You, you know? And, uh, but as we've got into mid-year, you know, your, your motivation starts to wane and you start skimping and, and cheating. And, you know, I, I, I have to admit, I hit a standstill at the beginning of June, the whole month of June. I was just tired the whole month. I don't know if it was allergies or what, but I was just fatigued and tired all the time. And during the whole month of June, I didn't lose anything. I lost 35 pounds pretty quickly in the first three months or three and a half months. And then in June, I didn't lose any weight at all. Now, again, insanity is just keep on doing what you're doing and expect different results. So I went and I did a little self-evaluation. I said, okay, what's the problem here? Why have I stalled? And I figured out, looking at, frankly, four things. Number one, I wasn't drinking enough water. You got to drink water if you're going to lose weight. And I had stopped drinking enough water, not as much as I did in the early days. Second, I wasn't getting enough sleep. I was burning the candle at both ends. I was trying to get a whole lot done. I was writing a whole new curriculum for our small groups on temptation, which we're going to reduce, uh, re, re, uh, re, how do you say it? <laughs> Make it available. <laughs> In a couple weeks. And, uh, you know, and I, and I wasn't getting enough sleep. If you don't get enough sleep, your body starts storing fat. You're not getting enough sleep. Uh, third thing, uh, I went to a doctor and found out I had low thyroid. And so they, they put me on a thyroid med. And uh, the fourth thing is um, I had stopped keeping my food journal. Well, you know, if you don't actually write down what you're eating and you're still in the learning the habit stage, you're going to cheat. <laughs> You've never done that. <laughs> Good. So yeah, I ate a few nuts. How many? Five or six handfuls. But it was nuts, you know, it was nuts. And so, I, you know, I made those changes. What am I doing? I'm doing a little evaluation, a little decluttering. I'm laying aside the weights because I want to finish the race. I don't just give up and say, oh, I stalled. I guess I'm not going to lose anymore. No. You just re reconsider and refigure. Now, it says you also want to lay aside the sins. Now, what's, what's a sin? A sin is knowing what to do and not doing it. You may write that down. A sin is knowing what to do and not doing it. It's not like you don't know what to do. You know the right things to do in your life. You just don't do it. You know what the Bible says about money? You know what the Bible says about time? You know what the Bible says about eating and sex and every other thing in your life? You just don't do it. And as a result, we get further and further in, in, uh, in, in trouble. James 4.17 says this, up here on the screen. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. So, I remember when I start to get discouraged, heaven's watching me, and Abraham and Moses and all those guys, they're pulling for me, and they've been through this. And then I stop and I go, what do I need to eliminate? What do I need to streamline? What do I need to declutter in my life? Even some good things, some weights that are holding me back. And some sins, certainly if I've got any unconfessed sin, if I'm holding on to a grudge, I'm holding on to guilt, then that's going to hold me down. Then number three, 
I must run God's race for me, not other people's race for me. I must run God's race for me, not others' race. You see, God loves you, and everybody else has a wonderful plan for your life. And they would love for you to run their race. The only thing is, God doesn't give you energy to run other people's races. He only gives you the energy to do what he put you on earth to do. Now, the third part of verse 1 says this. Let us strip off every weight and all the things that hinder us, the sin, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Circle the phrase, God has set. You are not expected to run the race other people set for your life. You are not expected to run the race culture sets for your life. You're not expected to run the race your parents set for your life. You are not even expected to run the race that you set for your life. God hasn't promised to bless your plan for your life. He's promised to bless his plan for your life. What he put you on this planet to do. Now let me just tell you, if you try to run somebody else's race, you're going to fail. You're going to lose. You're not going to make it to the finish line. You're going to tire and give up. Because God doesn't give you the strength to run other people's race. You are to run the race God meant for you to run. And you've got to stop caring so much about the approval of others and living for their approval. And you've got to be who God made you to be. You say, well, Rick, that's great. How do I know the race that's my race? How do I know the one that I'm supposed to run? It's real simple. Look at your shape. Look at your shape. Now, if you've forgotten what shape is, you need to go take class 301 again because in class 301, we teach how to understand and discover your shape, the five things that make you you. Spiritual gifts, S. H, your heart. A, your abilities. P, your personality. E, your experiences. Good, bad, and ugly. These five things, what am I gifted to do, what do I love to do, what am I talented to do, what fits with my personality, and what's based on my experience, shape determines the race you are to run. Shape determines purpose. God doesn't expect rabbits to fly. And God doesn't expect eagles to swim. And God doesn't expect fish to run. They're shaped to do what they are meant to do. And you're shaped to do what you're meant to do. And when people try to get you to run your race, it's like a fish trying to fly. It isn't going to work. And you're going to get discouraged. And you're going to get tired. Number four, I must focus on Jesus, not my circumstances. If I'm going to make it to the end of the race, if I want to... to, to uh, Make it to the end. I, I want to be all that God wants me, and I don't want to get discouraged, give up in the middle of the race. I need to focus on Jesus, not my circumstances. We are to run with endurance the race God set before us. And how do we run it? It says, next verse, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, not the road, on Jesus, not the crowd, on Jesus, not the critics, on Jesus in whom our faith depends from start to finish. You know, when they're teaching a dog at obedience school, they'll put a dog at one end of the room and they'll put the master at the other end of the room and between the puppy and the master, they put a bowl of food. And if the pup, and then the master is to call the puppy, if the puppy spies the food, he's a goner. He's going straight to the food because he's distracted by it, he's tempted. And so in obedience school, they teach dogs to keep their eyes on the master. That's what you gotta do. You can't be looking at your bank book balance. You can't be looking at the fact that you haven't had a job in a year or that some, your marriage is falling apart. You cannot simply look at the situation, you've gotta look at the savior. You can't look at the, as a victim, you've got to look at the victor. 
You can't look at the problem. You've got to look at the problem solver. You must keep your eye on Jesus. You say, Rick, you don't know what I'm going through. What I'm going through right now is unendurable. Friend, the only way you will be able to endure the unendurable is to keep your eye on the invisible. If you look at, Corey Ten Boom said it like this. Corey and her sister Betsy were incarcerated in Auschwitz because they were Christians in Holland. And then she wrote a book about this, The Hiding Place, and they hid Jews in their home to protect the Jews during the World War II from the Nazis. And one day they found the Jews and they not only took the people they were hiding, but they took the Corey and her entire family and took them to Auschwitz too. Betsy died there in the death camp. Corey later wrote, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. If you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. It all depends on what you've got your eyes on. It's all a matter of perspective. You can only do the impossible if you see the invisible. We keep our eyes on Jesus. What does that mean? It means I remember God's goodness to me in the past. I remember God's closeness to me in the present. I remember God's promise of power for me in the future. And I get my mind off my discouraging circumstances. I can either worry or I can worship. I can panic or I can pray. One of my favorite verses is Jonah 2.7. You know the story of Jonah. God said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, which was over in Syria. And, and he said, I, I want you to preach there. And Jonah didn't want to do that because he hated it. He was racially prejudiced against them. So he gets on board a boat going as far the opposite direction, east as possible. He goes to a seaport on the coast of Spain. And you know the story that God planned a little Mediterranean cruise for Jonah. The sailors throw him overboard and it says a great fish swallows him up. Now, by the way, it doesn't say in the Bible whale. It does not use that term. It says a great fish. If God wanted to create a one in a lifetime fish with an apartment building in it, God could do that. I don't have a problem with a God who, if he can create the universe, he can create anything he wants. Okay, really, if you believe God can create a universe, you don't have a problem God creating anything he wants to create for as long as he wants to create it. But while Job, uh, Jonah is at the bottom of the ocean and he's helpless and he's hopeless, in Jonah chapter two, he repents and he cries out to God. And in Jonah 2, seven, he says this. When I had lost all hope, I once again turned my thoughts to the Lord. That's a verse to memorize. Jonah 2, seven. When I had lost all hope, I once again turned my thoughts to the Lord. I want you to hear the story of Rob Treloff. Tra Rob Treloff is a doctor. He uh, medically trained, uh, uh, was a doctor at Mayo Clinic, and then on his own private practice, he is married to a Harvard trained attorney. He lives in Minnesota, and Rod leads two saddleback online small groups. An amazing story, if anybody knows pain, Rob knows it. When Rob was nine years old, his father was a minister of music at a church up in Anaheim. And one day in a freak accident, car accident, their car flipped and caught on fire. His mother and his brother were burned in that fire and died, burned alive. He was burned over much of his body. So this is a man who understands pain and whether you give up or you keep on keeping on. But he went on to become a doctor and as I said, served at Mayo Clinic. And then five years ago, another pain came into his life. He, he developed a very painful degenerative back disease, which left him 100% disabled, having to lay on his bed in the basement of his house, unable to, to live life normal. But Rod, Rob would not give up. And he had a friend in this church, Glenn Stiefe, who said, why don't you start watching Saddleback Church online? And so Rob started watching the church online and instantly this became his family because he was 
confined to his basement. And he heard about small groups and he heard about the peace plan and he said, I want to be a part in spite of the pain. I want you to watch this. My name is Rob Trolloff. For the past five years, I've been living my life flat on my back. My spine is literally falling apart. If, if someone were to ask me 20 years ago or 30 years ago where I would be right now, being flat on my back with constant pain is not where I would have put myself. Rob has, I think, maybe 20 different medications. He takes maybe 50 pills a day. There are days where he literally just can't do anything. He's just laying there in pain. In the past 10 years, I've had four major surgeries on my spine. Uh, after the major spinal reconstruction that we underwent at the Mayo Clinic, the surgeon came in and sat down and told Chris and I that I was going to be permanently disabled and literally that I had to get used to the fact that I would no longer be able to continue my profession as a physician. Rob is not unfamiliar with pain. Uh, when we were growing up, we were in a car accident. I was burned over 40% of my body my mother and brother never did make it out of the truck and were killed in the accident. God has used these experiences, many of them painful, to prepare me for ministry in a variety of ways. I, I think of the scripture, when you look and reflect on the things that he's going through, God has a way of putting it in perspective by calling it light affliction. So suddenly I find myself limited to a 12 by 12 room and a bed. And I've gone from an active busy practice now to essentially absolute peace and quiet. And I think God has put me on a shelf. I'm done. I started watching Saddleback Online Services and Pastor Rick was consistently telling us that we should be living out our Christian lives in the small group setting. So I became involved in an online small group as a host right from flat on my back. As I'm watching services, as though Pastor Rick were speaking to me, he begins to talk about the importance of sharing our faith on a daily basis. And I think, there's no way I can do this. I don't even get out of the house except to go to the doctor. And I began to pray, God, use me, and you're going to have to bring it to me because I can't move. Then a friend from Saddleback gives me a call and asks if I would be interested in working with the peace team that's going down to Rwanda. They're beginning a pilot program called telemedicine in which doctors with difficult patients can contact U.S. physicians and ask questions about how to deliver the best care. Yes, sir. Yes. And, uh, uh, so the, through the, the use of technology and via Skype, I'm able to connect with the physician in Rwanda face to face as they examine and talk about a patient. Now, instead of the doctors in Rwanda seeing the peace team several times a year with doctors, now they can contact a doctor in the U.S. that's a part of the peace team and, uh, anytime uh, the, yes, using the, the technology. Clear, that is really the right uh, God's given me a wonderful second chance to be able to share my faith, to help care for patients literally around the world, using technology, being face-to-face -face with people that are out there and in the trenches, to watch how God answered those prayers. He's taken me off the shelf, dusted me off, and put me right back into action. All for His glory. Now, I know Rob is watching this service, so let's all say, hi, Rob. Hi, Rob. Hi, Rob. All right, now, 
Tell me again your legitimate reason for not hosting a small group. <laughs> Tell me again your legitimate reason for not being a part of a peace plan project. There really is no excuse. Uh, he began this online small group and then it went, he now actually, it was so successful, he now leads two online small groups. And then as you said, yeah, he said, using Skype, he began consulting our peace teams and our doctors, uh, national doctors there in Rwanda, and, and became so helpful to him on a daily basis that the government asked Rod to teach a cardiology conference to the three uh, hospitals and all of their entire staff uh, in Rwanda from his bed. And so he's going to do that. Yeah. Now... I, I said, is there anything you want to say to your church family? He said, yes. Through the online ministry of Saddleback, I now have an international ministry. If I can lead two online Saddleback groups and I can be a part of the peace plan even while being completely confined to bed, God can use anyone. There is no excuse. If you're watching online and you would like to start an online group, just contact us and we'll help you start an online group. We have them all over America and we have them around the world now. And for those of you who are here at Lake Forest and in all of our campus, I would say to you, who do you know who's disabled or who is aged, who are, can't get around a whole lot, who do you know that you need to tell about Saddleback Online? And they could be doing their part and making a contribution where they are, even if they're confined to a bed. This wouldn't happen in Rod's life, Rob's life, if Glenn Stifey hadn't taken the initiative to invite him to be a part of it. So do that. Now, the fifth point is one that Rob perfectly models, and it's this. If I want to overcome my discouragement, I must minimize the pain and maximize the profit. I must minimize the pain and maximize the profit, the future reward, the benefit of keeping on, keeping on. Everything that's worth doing has some pain to it. Getting in shape has some pain to it. Getting in spiritual shape has some pain to it. Getting out of debt has some pain to it. Getting an education has some pain to it. Anything worthwhile has some temporary pain in order for there to be long-term benefit, reward, or payoff. The Bible says this about Jesus dying on the cross. Verse 2, the second part. He was willing to die <coughs> a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterward. Circle the word afterward. He's looking past the pain to the payoff. And what would that payoff be? Your salvation. You could have your sins forgiven. I could have my sins forgiven. We could go to heaven because of what Jesus would do on the cross for us. He knew he could handle the death because of the joy that would be his afterwards. And now he is seated in the place of highest joy and highest honor besides God's throne in heaven. You minimize the pain. In fact, write this down. You want to play it down and pray it up the pain you play it down and you pray it up you say this is not that big a deal people have gone through worse problems than i'm going through right now uh, like the guy we just saw i could give you let me just take you on a trip around the world most people would love to have your problems so play it down it's not that big a deal it's not the end of the world i'm still alive my mind still is here i'm still free play it down and pray it up let me give you a, a biblical example of this. In the book of 2 Corinthians, in chapter 11, Paul lists all the pain he went through in order to do his race, to follow the plan God has for his life. And it's not a happy list. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 11. Paul says, I've worked hard. I've been put in jail more often. I've been whipped times without number. I've faced death again and again and again. Five times... 
I was given 39 lashes. Now imagine that. If you've been whipped 39 times and five, five times 39 would be the number of lash marks on your back. Can you imagine the scars on his back? Five times I was given 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I've traveled many weary miles. I've faced dangers from flooded rivers and from robbers. And I've, I've faced dangers from my own people as well as the Gentiles. I've faced dangers in the cities and in the deserts and on stormy seas. I've faced dangers from men who claim to be Christians but aren't. I've lived with weariness, I've lived with pain, and I've lived with sleepless nights. I've often been hungry and thirsty and gone without food, and I've often shivered without cold, without enough clothing to keep me warm. Paul said, I went through all of this in order to be a missionary to the entire Roman Empire. Now, that's what he went through. Then you go back in the same book, and, and in chapter 4, you can read... This is what he says about it, his perspective on it. In light of all this, we do not lose heart. We don't give up. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. Now he calls all that he went through light and momentary troubles. Would you call that light and momentary troubles? I'd call that life a disaster. If I'd been in prison that many times, been beaten that many times, whipped that many times, shipwrecked, cold, thirsty, hungry, robbed, beaten up, bruised, stoned. And he goes, now, <clears throat> these light and momentary afflictions, what? That is a matter of perspective. He said, this stuff is small potatoes compared to the reward I'm going to get in heaven. Play it down and pray it up. Minimize the pain of doing the right thing. Yes, staying in that marriage and getting counseling will cause you some pain. But it's much more rewarding to resolve a relationship than to dissolve a relationship. Stay in it. Don't give up. And he says, I'm going to... I'm going to have these rewards forever. You maximize the reward. What's the reward? Oh, just eternal life. And by the way, how long does that one last? Forever. And what's it worth? Priceless. Priceless. And nobody can take it away from you once you've got it. Your salvation. So in light of this, let's all read Galatians 6 verse 9 together. And let's read it slowly aloud. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Now, circle the phrase proper time. God says we will reap a harvest at the proper time if we do not give up. But what I learned is that the proper time is not my time. Because my time is I always want the harvest now, today, instantly. I want a microwave harvest. <laughs> the law of the harvest is real simple. You plant in one season and you eat the fruit in another season. You do not plant one day and then eat the fruit the very next day. That has never happened. You plant one day and then you go through the seasons. Winter, spring, summer, or fall, all you got to do is call. <laughs> He'll be there. Now, you plant in one season, you reap in another. If you plant good things in your life, you will reap the harvest from that good works later on, but not instantly. If you start planting the seeds of a daily quiet time, you're going to reap the benefit of it in your life, but it's going to be in another season. If you start tithing your income, you're going to reap the benefit from it, but it's going to be in another season. If you start disciplining the way you eat, 
you're going to reap the benefit from it in another season. If you do anything good, you share the good news with a friend at work, you're going to reap the benefit from it for eternity. Now, some of you are not in the planting season. You're in summer and the heat's on and you're burning up. And you're thinking, I'm dying. I want to give up. And some of you have gotten into the fall and you're in the fall season and all the leaves have fallen off and you look pretty barren. And you go, nothing's going on in my life right now. I feel dead inside. And some of you, even though it's summer, you're in a spiritual winter. And in the spiritual winter, it's frozen and it's cold and it's gloomy and it's stormy and it's windy and there's nothing, no fruit on your branches. But you're putting down roots. You can't see it, but you're putting down roots. Hang on. Spring's coming again. In 1981, I was um, depressed the entire year. I was overwhelmed with the responsibilities of this church. It was the second year of Saddleback. I was still quite young. And I just thought, I, I'm not competent enough to handle this. And really, it scared me. And I was overwhelmed by the responsibility of this church. And for an entire year, I went through a period of depression and God had to teach me some things in that darkness that would prepare me to handle enormous amounts of stress later on. You don't just get this overnight. And God had to take me through a year, the dark year, in order to prepare me for other good, better years. And I remember on Saturday, each Saturday, I'd like to, I'd like to drive down to Laguna Beach. And I would sit at the beach, kind of calming my mind and clearing my mind and getting ready for the message on Sunday. And I would just watch the ocean. And one of the great truths that I learned that year was this. The tide goes out, but it always comes back in. The tide goes out, but it always comes back in. Now, when the tide goes out, the beach is ugly. And you can see driftwood and exposed rocks and junk and all kinds of things. It doesn't look that very good but it's coming back in. The tide may be out in your life right now. You may have been out of work for a long, long time. Are you gonna trust God? The tide, you say, you know, I've been waiting so long. I've been waiting to get married. I've been waiting to have a baby. I've been waiting to get feel better. I've been waiting, I've been waiting on and on and on and on. The tide goes out, but it always comes back in. Will you trust God? This is the sixth thing you need to do. And that is remember what Jesus did for me. Remember the suffering he went through when I'm suffering. Remember what he endured, not for his own sake, but what he endured for my sake on the cross. And he says, when you are enduring a tough time, you need to think about the attacks and the criticisms Jesus experienced. Think about the abuse and the cruelty Jesus went through. Think about the meanness and the torture and the painful death he went through, not for his benefit, but for you. Verses three and four. Think about all he endured when sinful people did such terrible things to him. That's what you think about, what he endured, so that you don't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. You need to think about what Jesus has done for you when you're going through a tough time. Now, I don't know what you're going through, but I do know this, it's a test of faith. It's a test of faith, it's a test of faith. God, as I said, it's easy to trust God when things are going great. It's when life doesn't go great that faith is proven. <clears throat> and so my question is, will you endure? Will you finish the race? Will you finish well? My question is this, what have you started that you need to finish? What is it that you've started that you need to finish and not give up in the middle of it? 
You know, a year before Paul wrote the book to the Corinthians church, the Corinthian church did basically like a decade of destiny offering where they did an offering. They said, we're going to take up an offering for the church at Jerusalem. Now, in those days, no church was going through good times. It was all tough times. But they said, we're going to take up an offering to help the church at Jerusalem. And a year later, they had made the commitment, but they still hadn't given it. And Paul wrote this to them, 2 Corinthians 8. Finish what you started a year ago. What did you start a year ago? For you were first to begin doing something about it. Now you should carry this project to completion just as enthusiastically as you began it. Give whatever you can according to what you have. So I ask you again, what commitments have you made that you need to complete? Maybe you made a commitment to finish your education and you never did it. Maybe you made a commitment to get out of debt and learn how to get out of debt and then you got discouraged and you just gave up and you're not even trying anymore. Maybe you've thought, I need to be baptized and you have, still haven't done it yet. You need to go out today after the service and I'll baptize you out there. We got a baptism after every service. Maybe you've intended to join a small group or start one and you've heard me talk about it for months or maybe even years and you're still not in a small group. What do you need to finish? What do you need to follow through on in a commitment? Maybe you started on the Daniel plan five months ago and now in the middle of it you've kind of gotten a little lazy about it and you've kind of given up and and you haven't finished the race, you haven't reached your goal, and you need to recommit to that. Six months ago, we, we made a commitment, like the Corinthian church, we did a decade of destiny, and where our members, we committed to give over a three-year period in order to do 12 major projects that are gonna help you in your physical life, your financial life, your spiritual life, all these different things. And some of you I know at the time were going, you know, Rick, I'm out of work and I, I just don't have the faith to make a commitment. Okay, that's between you and God. But what about now? I'm going to give you a chance now. You could do it today, in, in, right in front of you. We didn't even print any new envelopes. They're the same ones from last six months ago. You need to join us and, and be a part of that. Or maybe you made a commitment to Decade of Destiny and then you kind of haven't been real faithful to, to completing it. You need to do that. You need to finish it. I, I don't know. I really don't know what it is in your life that you need to finish what you start. But God does. So I want us to bow our heads right now. And with your head bowed, I want you to ask God what you need to complete. Maybe you've never finished 101, 201, 301, 401. I, I, I don't know. Maybe he'll give you two or three things, but say, God, I don't want to be a loser. I don't want to be a quitter. I don't want to stop in the middle of the race. I want to finish what I started. And if he tells you something or tells you a couple of things, I want you to write it down on your, on your outline right now. Because if you don't write it down, you'll forget it. And even after we've talked about it, you won't do anything. Write down one or two things that you need to finish, that you made a commitment to do, that you haven't been faithful in doing. Now follow me in this prayer. Dear God, help me to remember that heaven is watching me, that there is a crowd of witnesses observing my life. Help me to declutter my life, to eliminate what doesn't matter, to focus on what matters most. Help me to lay aside the weights and the sins that are slowing me down, holding me back, and causing me to want to feel like giving up. I want to run your race for me, not somebody else's race. I want to be exactly what you intend for me to be, not what other people expect me to be. Help me to focus, Jesus, on you, not my problems, not my debts, not my circumstances, not my pain. Help me to focus on you, Jesus. 
keeping our eyes on him whom our faith depends from start to finish. I want to minimize the pain and maximize the profit. Help me to play it down and pray it up. To not become weary in doing good, but to wait for the right season when I see the harvest. Jesus, most of all, I want to thank you for what you did for me, how you suffered, and what you endured so that I could be forgiven, and I could be saved, and I could go to heaven, and I could be in your family. If you've never invited Jesus Christ into your life, say, Jesus Christ, come into my life right now. I want to love you and trust you and serve you. I want to get to know you from this day forward. In your name I pray. Amen.